Hi everybody, my name's Antoinette and welcome to Good Owl Games. And normally by now I'd be telling you about the games I played over the last month, etc. But since the year has changed, something bigger is in order. So welcome to the annual roundup for 2021, the year that it was. <laughs> So hello and welcome to the new year everybody. I hope you had a fantastic holiday season and are all bright and ready to tackle whatever 2020 may bring us. Um, so monthly roundup videos normally I talk about the new games I got, what I've been playing, well all that's kind of going out the window. Um, so I'll put sections below for the different things you may or may not be interested in listening to. Um, so firstly I'm just going to look at kind of my stats for the year. So what I played, how many games I played etc etc. Um, I also want to do a section where I look at kind of my top photographs from the year, my top board game photographs, um, and see if we've learned anything interesting there. Um, I'll still do a personal bit at the end about maybe some of the hopes for 2022. Oh my God, I'll never get used to saying that. Um, and maybe some plans and stuff for the channel. And right at the very end, I'm doing a giveaway. Woo! So you can all thank Osprey Games for that. Um, have you any idea what it might be? Yes, of course, it's the Irishy board game. So I'm giving away a copy of Brian Baru and, and all details for that will be at the end of the video because of course I'd like you to watch it first. Um, but yeah, it'll be easy and things like that. So stay tuned. So I'm gonna jump right into the stats here. Um, so first of all, do any of you use an app for tracking your board game plays? Why would you do such a thing? Well, if you're like me and you're a bit of a, is an info file a, a word? I, I have a feeling there's something there that should be a word, but it isn't. Um, so I particularly use the, the BG Stats app. You put it on your phone. Um, I do believe it's free and you can pay like a little bit of money to unlock kind of some extras. And what you do is that when you play a game, um, it keeps track of your collection and you put in who won or the scores and things like that. And then it's really fun to look back and see, well, the last time I played this, this was my score. So I did better this time. Or it's particularly fun at the end of the month or the end of the year to see which games you played the most of, maybe the games you played the least. I have a lot of fun with it personally. I use it all of the time. And so at the end of the year, then you can look back and see, well, what were our most popular games? Now, my problem with the app is the fact that you're more likely to play quicker games more, right? So if, you know, so you play, I don't know, five games of the mind, that'll take, you know, the same length of time it might've taken you to play a heavier game. So I think it kind of, it's preferenced, I guess, towards the lighter games. And I think that's definitely true in what I've been playing. But over the year, in case you're interested, um, so I've played 69 different games, um, 60 of which I owned, which is not surprising. Um, I had 211 plays overall. And this is down from the previous year. And I kind of knew that. I don't know about you guys, but 2021 wasn't the best year for board games for me. I didn't feel like there was a kind of a ton of new exciting things coming out to look forward to. I also don't know if it's just I'm settling into the hobby and I finally got to the point where I played all the old oldies um, and things I really wanted to try and now I'm just kind of waiting for the next big thing. Or I also don't know if this is attributed to the fact that a lot of conventions and things were cancelled or that it was more difficult to get to them. Like normally I would have gone to Essen Spiel but that was so kind of, I don't know, it seemed kind of uncertain at the time um so that might be to it but I definitely feel like I played less games this year and I have proof of that so yeah be sure to tell me if you use an app or if you don't why not and if you want to share some of your stats with me I'd be pretty curious to see it I'd love to know who played like the least amount of games um uh, but still kept tracking them anyway I, I you know I don't think you have to have played lots of games to have lots of fun mm, that's just me so take note that normally we play a large variety of games as opposed to playing the same game repeatedly. So these ones that are in the top five are actually rather special. But we're going to start anyway at number five, which is a big surprise to me and possibly everyone around me. And this is Batman Gotham City Chronicles. <laughs> Um, so, um, I got this game actually, yeah, pretty much a year ago in a trade and my husband's a really big Batman fan and we kind of had our eyes on it for ages. We assumed it was going to be rubbish, but you just can't get rid of those feelings sometimes. You know, when you just, you just have to try it yourself, even if it is terrible and boy, oh boy, were we surprised. Um, so 
Batman Gotham City Chronicles is a game where one of you um, or a group of you can play as Batman and a number of Batman related cohorts if you've read the comics or things like that I'm sure there's lots of people in here you'll recognize um, and they play against villains and it is a scenario based game where there is a board and the villains have an objective and usually the good guys are trying to stop them somehow or interfere with it um, it's got a bit of a bad rap because of its rule book and I'm kind of not overly surprised. It also has a large number of symbols that you have to contend with um, that aren't even located in the same place on your characters so you kind of know where to look. But beyond that, if you can get over that, there's a really fun game in here. I really like how light and kind of fun all the scenarios are. This isn't really a dark, gritty Batman. It's definitely leaning more towards the Adam West Batman. You get a whole host of miniatures, which are absolutely gorgeous. Um, the boards are nice, although they also have problems too. Um, but it just seems to be a lot of like little functional things. And I think if you can just, you know, figure out a solution kind of on your own as a team or as a group and agree to particular kind of rules or things like that, that you can have a lot of kind of fun with this. Um, I really, really like the way your character works. Um, so your character has a number of energy cubes that they can use and you place them into various actions to determine what you're going to do. But you only get back so many of those cubes at the start of each turn. So it really is about kind of deciding when to do what and to not run out of energy. So it's smart. It's fun. It's got a lot of good stuff going for it. And it's a big game. So I'm really surprised that we played it as much as we did. I think partially um, this is to do with the fact that every time somebody came to visit, we were like, oh, you have to see Batman. <laughs> um, so we showed it off quite a lot. But also we found ourselves buying some of the expansions for the game. So when an expansion arrived, we wanted to play it with the expansion. So we got ourselves a Batmobile with wheels that don't move. Don't get me started. Um, I got an expansion with a T-Rex in it that lives in Wayne Manor. Like, how cool is that? Um, I do wish there were more scenarios for these special things. There actually are very few, which annoyed me a lot after kind of forking out quite a bit for the expansion to not be able to use everything or integrate it fully with the base game. But I'm still very fond of Batman. I'm amazed we played it this much for a game that we really didn't think much of. So that's definitely a surprise for the year. So that's Batman Gotham City Chronicles. So in fourth place is possibly my favorite small game of all time. Um, you can check out my review for it somewhere up there. And this is Saikatsu. Um, and Saikatsu is this beautiful game in which you are basically trying to gather things together in a garden so that you can view it from your specific standpoint. So the board is kind of designed in such a way that everybody has a side and it's got rows and columns on it. And what you want to do is you have these beautiful chips and they have birds on them and the birds have kind of flora and fauna around them. So when you play a bird down to the board, you want to connect it up with similar birds for points. Um, now, the flora and fauna part is for end game scoring and those need to be connected in kind of those rows like I discussed um, to get yourself more points. It's very simple. It's very satisfying to play. Those chips are really clunky and fun. I really like the art and it's quick to play and it can be incredibly strategic, especially at two players. I, I think it plays up to three or you could do four, I think, in teams. Um, but I really like it at two because you're starting to go, well... Every time you put something out on the board, it might benefit your opponent. So you're having to think about what's good for you and what's not good for them. Um, and you can really get into this whole, you know, blocking each other off, building things out. Um, I think it's just such a fun puzzle and it's quick to play as well. Nice and simple, very pretty. Can absolutely highly recommend. And I'm pretty sure we played, well, we've played a lot of it this year, but I'm pretty sure I played a lot of it last year too. Just one of those kind of quick and easy to take down and have a go games. And you'll find yourself playing it a couple of times I think when you play it as well so I cannot but recommend Saikatsu if you want to find out more about it you can you can see what I said I'm pretty sure that video is some sort of love letter to Saikatsu but sure why not it's just that good so number three brings me to a game I had for review and this is Imperium Classics from Osprey Games and this game is oh it's something else isn't it um and the fact that it's up so high here um should give you an indicator of just how many times i played this game before i reviewed it i think it's 11 um making giving it some sort of record and there is a reason that this game got so many plays because it really tore me up how i felt about it 
So Imperium Classics, well, it is a, a card game and it's a tableau builder. And what it is, is that you are a growing civilization and you start with a deck of cards and then you're able to purchase and add different cards into your deck um, as you go through kind of all the different developments. Um, and each um, factions deck is different and it plays slightly differently as well um, sometimes they'll have different ways to get kind of these development cards and things for later on um, and it, it's pretty it's cool it's so many things that I really like in a board game um, I, but I did I did have a number of issues with it and I think the main issue being is that this game is so close to being on the money um, but there's just a couple of places where it falls short and I had a really hard time pinpointing where those places were or why it was that I wasn't having as much fun as I felt like I should because every time I sat down to play the game I'm all, I was always excited about it because the idea behind it is so good and like I definitely want to play a civilization I definitely want to play a card game I definitely want to see this all kind of develop as I play you know there's something very cool about that um, I suppose the biggest standout is it takes a very long time time for two of us to play I couldn't imagine playing this with more people talking hours um and I always felt like the decks didn't quite fit together just right and maybe that's on purpose um maybe that is a design element but for me I found it really really tough like my, my deck would say you know you'll get victory points for having a certain number of food on this card um but there's a limit to how much food you can have on the card and after that well, what was I supposed to do next? You know, where did it go? I think it leaves it very open to interpretation how you want to play it and how you want to score victory points and things like that. And I, I maybe I just missed that guidance. I don't know if I just needed hand-holding or not. I'm not entirely certain. Um, but the problem was every time we finished the game, we were like, oh, God, I don't want to play that again. And then we'd be like, do you want to play it again? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I find I find it rather addictive and, and hard to pinpoint, yeah, why why I didn't love it more because I really, really wanted to love it. Um, so I do think there is a ton of potential here. Maybe other people will simply like it more than I did. But I definitely um, gave it a fair shot when playing it and before reviewing it. So if you want to see what I said about that, you can have a look. Um, but yeah, I still I still am quite fond of the game, dis despite it feeling like it wasn't wasn't quite there or wasn't quite right so yeah so that's imperium classics god i'd play it again like i'd play it now it's a bit weird all right let's roll on to the next number so this next title has a very special place in my collection because it's one of only two games i've ever repurchased um so the first was carcassonne yes at one point i got rid of carcassonne and then decided i just wanted to play tiles again so reacquired that um but the second is root from later games so yeah i always find this one interesting because when root came out initially there was a really big buzz people were really excited and of course i was excited because i'm like what is it um and we got ourselves a copy of root and when we originally owned it we actually played it five times i think before like we decided that maybe it wasn't going to get played in our house that it felt like it would be a better game with more people um so so root is a asymmetric game meaning everyone is playing to win in a slightly different way it's set in this cutesy woodland setting um to lure you into not thinking it's vicious when it is and basically yeah you're trying to get you're trying to use your own way to win while also thwarting that of everybody else um so there's some really nice things about root as a game it's very well put together it's hard to teach to new people because you know everyone is so different and i guess once you go in knowing that that's not so bad but i do love how the different factions function um i love that you can just pick up something else to play and try something new and, and the game suddenly becomes different because you're looking at it in a different way and i think that's a, a superpower that root has and of course it well it's adorable so everybody loves it um but the problem we had was my husband didn't like playing root with me as much as i liked playing it with him and at two players it can be a bit i don't know i think this is a game that really benefits from having you know plenty of people play it with you 
Um, so whatever, for whatever reason, we decided we weren't going to play it much and we moved it on. And then, like, last year, just before Christmas, I kind of, I missed it. I kind of wished I could try it again. And I got it for Christmas last year. And here it is now as the number two played game of the year. Um, I think a lot of those plays came together. There was a point where we were just playing route back to back really quickly. We were we were managing to play a two player game in like 30, 40 minutes. Um, so we were playing lots of them. And once I figured out I was really happy playing the Vagabond, I just kept playing it. And I finally figured out a strategy. So I felt like I had a handle on things. And I enjoyed it much more the second time round. I think because I knew what to expect. I think sometimes you have expectations about games and how they're going to go and whatnot. And when they don't quite meet them, it's not that necessarily the game's fault, but it does kind of alter how you view the game. So going back in the second time, knowing what I knew about Root, we actually enjoyed it a lot more. So yeah, so that's Root. Um, I'd love to know which faction do you play? I am the Vagabond. I fondly call myself the murder hobo because I... <laughs> Because I like running around and making people lose dice. Um, yeah, good, good, good times. So I want to hear, yeah, what your favourite faction is if you've played Root. Um, and now we'll move on to numero uno, or Iverahane, I suppose, as I should be saying. So unsurprisingly, um, this game got a lot of plays this year. Um, I'm not shocked it's in number one. Um, it's a game that we really enjoyed playing. We'd continually take it out, play a couple of games back to back. I think it just speaks to us as kind of card gamers um, as that kind of feel to it. Um, and this is It's a Wonderful World. Um, so It's a Wonderful World is a game in which you're basically building a civilization. This is, this, I've said this before today. Um, except that this is a tableau builder kind of card drafting game. And what you do is you, you'll have cards, you'll put them out onto the table. You use resources to kind of complete them. So then you can put them in your tableau. That, I said tableau twice there, but you get what it means. So you put it into play. You pay its payment and then it kind of goes into your industry pile where it'll now produce stuff for you instead of cost you stuff. Um, and that's basically the game. <laughs> um, it's played over kind of a short number of rounds. I always feel like it's never long enough. The art in the game is really special. It's kind of retro futuristic. And I love that a, like a lot of the cards you will put into play will have multipliers. So you'll be like, this is worth this many victory points for every many blue cards you have um, or things like that. And it's kind of, it's very simple. Now, what's quite special about this, I think, compared to other titles is the order in which things produce. So there are five colored cubes in total that you're gonna to need to put on your card so you can make them, um, but they resolve in a particular order. So that means that you could build something in the first phase and put it into your production pile and it will produce then later on if it's still kind of, you know, if it's capable of doing so by the time the phase gets there. That was a very convoluted sentence. But basically what it means is you can plot things so that you can get stuff off at the right time wow I'm really good at this today you can tell it's kind of after Christmas um but I'm really really fond of this um this is just like card messing tableau building with cubes and stuff at its finest and you know multiplying up the number of cards you have by things you know it's one of those you've definitely seen something like it before but that production bit makes it quite different um and yeah we absolutely love 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 the game so yeah that's why it's the most played game of the year yeah, I'm not even surprised at all. So I'd love to know what your most played game of the year is. Do you know? Were you surprised by this information? If you had to look it back, would you be like, wow, I didn't think I played so many games of that. Mm, yeah, tell me in the comments. And I'm going to very quickly then roll on to the next section. We're going to see some of the kind of most popular photos I, of board games I took this year. Um, and let's see what games they were, because I think that's kind of fun. Right, so hopefully most of you guys noticed that um, I take a lot of photos of the board games I play um, and they're on social media. So if you haven't had a chance to check out my Twitter account, their Facebook page or Instagram, if one of those is your jam, um, you can kind of see what I've been playing and a little bit of my thoughts about it. Um, I'm a bit fascinated actually by Instagram because I feel like I don't really know how it works or how people choose what they might like to see. But um, I'm always a bit fascinated at how people respond to something you took a photograph of. So I'm going to look at these in terms of the, the reach. I don't exactly know. Okay, yeah, how many people got to see my photos um, and which ones went the furthest. Um, so I'm going to start, we'll do 10. We'll actually, we'll do nine because nine's nice and even looking. And um, picture number nine is of 
Well, this is Brian Brew who's sitting here in the background for me with that beautiful map of Ireland. Um, so yeah, so if you haven't heard me talk about Brian Brew yet, there's a whole video about that, unsurprisingly. Um, and really what Brian Brew is, it's a really unusual trick-taking game in which you're trying to become High King of Ireland by using cards, winning tricks and claiming towns. Um, it's pretty, it's very innovative. You need three players to play it, which is such a shame. Um, but overall, it's a very clever, very fun and bright and colourful game. Um, one I'd highly recommend. Um, I'm surprised that this photo is here. Maybe people just like seeing maps of Ireland I guess I don't know is, is Brian Brew that interesting to like the outside world maybe it is I don't know um so then picture number eight all right so picture number eight this is <laughs> here we, I, I keep wanting to call it rising sun but I know it's not rising sun beyond the sun there we go <laughs> rising sun's a very different game um, so Beyond the Sun is kind of one of the newest offerings from Rio Grande games and it looks like nothing. It's got no art, no style, but what it is is a game about advancing your tech and your kind of colonizing space a little bit um yeah mostly it is a game about going up tech trees um i quite like the recess board that was in it that you can see in the photo right because you know that that that's what apparently what appealed to people with all the tokens that doesn't even show most of the game but there you go that's your player board um and it's actually really really fun um it's a good dry euro um i liked it quite a bit i haven't pulled it out really now since we got it i must go back and give it another go um but it was a very well put together game i just wished it looked a little bit nicer but apparently instagram thought it looked nice which is grand okay next i keep looking down my phone ha so this only went up the other day so i'm amazed it's doing so well so fast i don't know maybe people are are, are excited or were on like instagram far more over the holidays so this is a picture of race for the galaxy and that's my favorite card in race for the galaxy the new galactic order um okay so what's race for the galaxy about um Prepare yourself for all the symbols. So Race for the Galaxy is you while exploring the galaxy and planets and setting up developments and things like that out there. Um, and how it works is, well, it's very clever. So everyone gets to choose a phase that they would like to activate during the turn. So I think there's like seven of them. Um, so they're things like settling, drawing cards, developing, um, producing things in the worlds you have, consuming things in the worlds you have. And what's cool is everyone gets to choose a phase and you get to activate all of the phases that people have chosen. So you can kind of combo things together like that. Um, there is a benefit for you activating the phase you all already have which is you know kind of how it works um but yeah the game has a lot of symbols a lot of colors um but it's very satisfying to play and very fun i also think it's a it's a good challenge of a game um i've played a lot of it um online i actually i mentioned it in a, a video before actually about my my favorite kind of online versions of board games if you want to go and check that out there was a free version of it to play um but i love playing it in real life and my favorite strategy um is to win by military so you you can do that and that's see with those kind of red circles they see in the picture um so what i want to know is do you play race of the galaxy and if so what's your favorite strategy and is it a winning one i don't know if my military strategy is very winning but um i like it a lot and i love that card because it gives so many bonuses to military okay so next okay so this is cascadia um, so this is fairly a fairly new acquisition to my collection um, and it is a puzzle game about grouping types of animals together. Um, so how it works is there will be a set number of goals for while you play that will tell you kind of the way they want you to position your animals out on that little board that you can see in the picture. So the animals are on the discs and then the different terrain types are you know what they're sitting on and it's up to you to kind of put them out in those orders to get yourself points. Um, it's a pretty fun puzzle. It's definitely fairly kind of open-ended. You can build it whatever way you like. Um, and I liked, I liked it quite a bit. Um, I do wish that the, the boards, you know, with the terrain looked a little nicer. Maybe that's just me. I just think they look kind of busy all together. Um, but it is a really fun and cool kind of puzzle game. I should play more. I should play more of it. I, I like it a bit. And those like little animals are nice and satisfying to click down onto your board. Um, so yeah, I don't know why this one appealed to everybody so much. Maybe it's because Cascadia is kind of a, a new thing. It's just out right now. So maybe that's something to do with it. Um, okay, so next photo. 
let me check yeah that's what I thought it was um so yeah I just played this one before Christmas um and this is Vindication from Orange Nebula Games um this is kind of a game that doesn't I don't know if it gets talked about a lot but it's always on the periphery and I think it probably deserves a little bit more attention than it gets comes in a very big box it's very fancily designed and what it's about is basically vindicating yourself it starts with you having been kicked off a ship because you were wretched and terrible and now you're trying to kind of make yourself into a better person through this game through this board game which is essentially a game of pushing cubes around the place so what what it kind of is is that you're going to places getting cubes of the right color and then using those to get attributes for yourself to make you a better person um um, it's supposed to be kind of a thematic euro but I don't really get that myself but I do really like the game just as it is I don't think you know the theme is funny in some parts so for instance there's a, a bag you take the tokens out of and it's called a scum bag Ooh. Um, and there's a lot of nice touches like that and it's it's a very beautiful production but I you know and I like it a lot actually as far as cube cut pushers go this is a pretty great game so you're gathering cubes to do your stuff and then you do it all over again um, but yeah it's fun it's got some nice touches to it so I can definitely recommend Vindication um, I wonder why the picture is so popular I, I don't know um, maybe it looks unusual with all those triangle pieces you don't see those in most board games Okay, so what's next? <laughs> this picture got me in so much trouble. Um, so this, for those uninitiated, this is a picture of A Feast for Odin, which I got just before Christmas. Um, this is the only Uwe Rosenberg game I own. And it's one myself and my husband thought about for a bit of a time. We have a friend of ours that's a very big fan of Rosenberg, so we just get to play all the games via him, and we never really felt like we needed to own our own one. Um, but this is the one that stuck out the most, the Feast for Odin, in which you are Vikings, and you're basically needing to fill your people, fill out your lands, and it's a giant kind of worker placement game in which you can have a multitude of options or things to do. So you can go and raise animals, you can go raiding, you can go get crops, you can build buildings, there's a bunch of things you can do. And what you kind of do with your items is that you're filling out your player board. So it's kind of like a polyonimo grid, as you can see in the picture, to cover up as many gaps as possible so you don't lose victory points. Now that's oversimplifying the game for sure. Um, there's definitely more going on than that. Um, but this picture caused me a bunch of hassle because I broke a number of rules. <laughs> so if you look in the picture, there um, are blue tiles and green tiles, and they're the kind of ones that you're allowed to put on your board. Um, but there's a rule about green tiles touching and blue tiles touching, and I broke all of them because I was still <laughs> I was still figuring out how that yoke works. Um, so yeah, there was a lot there was a lot of uproar about this. I've since played again, and I have a separate photo, so we'll see if you know that will be more approved of by people um but yeah feast for odin is um a really fun game actually i like it i liked it more the more we got to play with it i feel i'm getting more familiar with it and that seems to really enhance it so maybe that's just me being slow i don't really know but yeah i, I liked i liked the feast for odin a lot and apparently so did the internet so huh all right next up on the internet list <laughs> Right, so number three. So this is a, a photo of um, some board game components I popped out. And if you didn't recognize them, they're the components for A Feast for Odin, which did better than the picture of A Feast for Odin. But mm, yeah. there's something about popping out pieces of cardboard that makes it feel like very, very Christmas around here or very birthday. You know, when you've got a board game or two and you're like, oh, all this stuff that needs popping. Um, and yeah, I was trying to capture that in the picture. I literally just took a snap of it to see. Um, and apparently people kind of resonated with this feeling. So yeah, do, do you enjoy popping this stuff out? Like, for me, it's a bit of a labour. I'm not a huge fan of it. But, you know, it's got to be done, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's picture number three. So, picture number two. Also surprised by this one. And this is a picture of Lignum. Um, so, Lignum is one of my favourite Euro games of all time. And it has a very boring premise. I suppose like good Euro games. And this is a game about chopping wood. <laughs> um, so yeah, L Lignum is not good. I don't want to call it worker placement. I don't exactly know how you place it. But basic, basically how Lignum works is 
you're trying to go through the entire process of making wood so that you can make money. So it starts with you chopping down the wood in the forest, but you're gonna need men to chop down the wood in the forest. And if you are going to move your wood from the forest, well then you have to transport it somehow. So maybe you'll need a horse and a cart, or maybe you'll send it down the river. But then what happens when it gets to the other end? You're gonna need someone to chop it into smaller bits of wood. That's fair enough, so you need more people, but they're gonna need saws so that they can chop it into smaller bits. And then once that's them, well then what are you gonna do with it? You can only store so much wood, so you're gonna dry it? Are you gonna age it out? Are you gonna sell it? That's the whole game. <laughs> um, and what, it's, pay, it's played over a number of seasons, including a winter season where you have to feed your workers. <gasps> My favorite. Um, and kind of, <laughs> this is a game that just sets you up and tells you what you need to do, and then you just watch yourself fail. Um, how it works is that there is a board you travel around, and there are spots on it you stop at to buy things, pick up things, or do stuff. Um, and this is shared for everybody, so that you kind of you'll stop at a particular point and go right. I'm going to buy my saws now to give to my people. So you have to do a hell of a lot of planning to make this work exactly as you'd hoped. Um, it's the kind of game where money is very tight. There are objectives you can aim for and things like that as well. But um, I absolutely love how, not, it, it's brutal, maybe that's the word. I normally don't like games in which they're mean for the sake of being mean. But this game doesn't feel like that. It feels like, <laughs> it feels like you have a specific problem to do and you have to do it. Um, and everything that goes wrong is entirely your fault. <laughs> but for some reason, I love it. I love this planning it out because it's, it's all there in front of you you just you just got to work with it so I'm a really big fan of Lignum um it's not it doesn't seem to be an overly popular game for people to try I guess maybe the theme puts you off but I, I liked it a lot I think it's a, a really cracking game and so I'm amazed that so many people on Instagram were curious about it so now the very last photo and this this to me is weird but anyway we'll, we'll roll on with it um so this photo um I took literally just before Christmas um, we were sitting down and we were like, what haven't we played in a while? And my husband goes, we should play Side. And I'm like, God, yeah, we haven't played Side in ages, which is very true. I want to say like a year and a half since we played Side. So we took it out of the box and I put it on the table. And you can see in the picture, like not everything is set up yet. That's just me getting my components out of the box. And I had like, I, had, I still had a cup of tea and I had like a pastry or a tart or something. I was just finished dinner. And I just looked at it all coming out of the box. And do you ever just get that feeling of, Oh, wow, yeah, I missed this. Um, and that's exactly what that photo is supposed to be. I was like, wow, I'd forgotten how much is in this box and how much feeling I had attached to what is in the box. Um, so, Scythe, what's it all about? Scythe was such a popular game for a while. It was like the thing everybody got. Um, so it is a, a very cool, I think it's such a smooth game, actually, um, worker placement game in which you are trying to gain resources, place buildings out on maps, you're trying to explore. Um, and there are a number of different ways to win this. You get them through winning um, awards. And the game ends when I think it's five or six rewards have gone out. Um, and it's up to you, I guess, how you want to play the game, what awards you want to try and win. So these could be things like, you know, winning combat or Get our, <laughs> trying to remember all the other ones I want. Place all your workers, get all the upgrades, that kind of thing. Um, and Scythe is a very beautiful game. You get like little minis, you get these lovely recess boards in which all of your meeples and things can sit. Um, and there's something very elegant about how the actions work because there are two parts to every action, a top part and a bottom part. And, and when you choose kind of a row, you're choosing this top and bottom. And how you put them together and things is all up to you. And they're all interchangeable, so that can feel different every time you play. Um, I'd forgotten how good a game Scythe is. Um, and it, there was just some really lovely, warm feelings about pulling it out. Up until the point where the game ended. Because <laughs> the game ends when somebody places the last star out or has won like the, the last achievement. And then there's no more turns, there's no extras, there's no nothing. And I really needed another turn and I'm reminded that I hate how this game ends. <laughs> I hate that it's like, you really do have to be watching everybody else. And I think, I think other group players or groups will enjoy that maybe a little bit more than I did because we're playing it at two. And my husband has the tendency to put out two or three stars in a go together and the game just end and you not be prepared. So I think you do have to watch what everyone else is up to a little bit to not get caught out like I did. 
but it was still was really fun and obviously my photo somehow resonated with with people because that, that that's how I was looking at it at the time and that's my most popular photo in the past year so it, it's good to see that the love for side is still out there somewhere because there was a time when everyone was just all side this and side that um but yeah so that's pretty cool so I don't know if you enjoyed that as much as I did um, and you got to hear about some cool new games, but it, it's funny seeing what people liked or were interested in, isn't it? Um, yeah, something like that. All right, so um, I've been here for quite a while. I'm going to move on to the last section. So I'll very do a very small amount of goals for the new year and stuff like that, a little discussion about last year, and then I will tell you all about this competition you're going to have to enter for a copy of Brian Baru. So very quickly, let me wish you all a happy new year. And I really hope that this year is going to be better than the last one. I think everybody's hoping something similar. Um, 2021 had been a, a pretty odd year for me. Um, it really seemed to go all over the place. Um, I suppose the big change, of course, was that I went from being board game Inquisition to being good Owl Games. Um, I think it's sitting well. I, I, I think I like the Owl theming. Um, much better than the Inquisition theming. <laughs> um, although it's still it's still a little odd at times, I think, to, to, re to remember that. Um, I also had a lot of fun where I got to work with Ren Games earlier in the year. It was kind of exciting. I can't believe that was this year. It feels so long ago. And of course, I've got to cover all sorts of kind of interesting games and hopefully bringing you guys something fun to watch. Um, I do feel like, yeah, like I said earlier, that I played less board games and I've definitely had less interesting games at certain points in the year. Um, I don't know if that means I'm kind of burning out on games. I'm not sure. I just think I'm burning out on life in general. Um, but, you know, that that's not the game's fault. So we'll see what this year brings. I hope it'll be something really exciting and fresh that'll just give me a bit of get up and go to put everything together. Um, but yeah, so um, what am I doing this year? Have I any goals? Have you got any goals? Do people make goals and try and stick to them? Some people do. Um, I think my goal for the channel this year is to to not be afraid. Um, I'm very fearful about doing all sorts of things. Um, whether that be stupid things like trying a different type of video or, you know, or playing around with something that I normally have set up, you know, that I have a particular thing for. I would like to just try and like, be, yeah, be less fearful and enjoy things a little bit more. Um, <sighs> Yeah, something, something like something like that. Um, God knows how easy or hard that might be to achieve. Um, but I want to remind myself that this is my hobby and not my job. And while I wish this was my job, or wish I had a job of any sort, um, this is the thing I'm trying to do for fun. And I want to keep it fun. I want to keep you guys entertained. And I need that balance between the feeling of I should be making things because they're, you know, they're kind of people watching, but also that I want to make things that are, are fun for me to make. Um, and it's, it sounds like it sounds so easy to do that when you say it out loud. But for whatever reason, my brain just doesn't want to put these things together. So, um, yeah, that's the goal for this year. Um, I'm glad I suppose the last year has got worth it. The last year even go. <laughs> it's madness, people. But we'll see what we'll see what this year brings and what we get up to. I, I hope you guys have like some goals in mind, some achievable goals. You know, maybe it's to win a game of a feast for Odin. I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's nice to have something to work towards. OK, so. The reason most of you are actually, uh, no, 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 hold on, because, no, hold on. Have any of you wondered where the Golden Board Game Awards went? Well, I know I did, because normally over Christmas, myself and my husband make an annual award show, but you may have noticed that didn't happen today. Um, there just wasn't enough time for it to get it made this year, and I didn't want to put a ton of pressure on myself to get it ready in time but loads of you um gave me suggestions for questions so I thought I would tell you what the categories were really really quick and um, what my answers would have been okay so here's the miniature golden board game awards okay so these were the categories. So I'm just gonna do this fire popping kind of sh sugars stuff. Okay so um the rules for this were should be 
I don't even need the rose because Brian's not here, so it's just me. So, ha! Okay, so the first category was going to be Child Surprise, um, which is a game that really surprised me that we got this year, or that we played this year, and that award goes to A Feast for Odin. I didn't think we were going to buy that at all. I think it shows how desperate we were to buy new board games before Christmas, but I'm kind of glad we picked it up. I'm surprised by how good it is. So, Child Surprise, Feast for Odin. Next up. So the game that will take up the most space on the table, the Table Hog Award, and I'm giving that to Praga Kaput Regni. <laughs> this game is huge. Like the game board is huge and then it's got extra bits on it and then you got your own player board and you got your own player disc. It's, it's massive. That thing, that thing beats a feast for Odin in terms of, of table hogging. Um, so yeah, so that wins that. That's Praga Kaput Regni. Um, so then the next question was best Euro game and I think I gave it to Lignum um, because I, I just I just love it it deserves some more awards but you heard me talk about that earlier and then I went for best rest of the world game then if that was the best Euro game I think I'm actually going to give to Calico um, I think that's just such an elegant tidy design in a really pretty package it's the kind of thing you can show to anybody um, I think I'll, I'll go there with that what was next? Um, so an oldie but a goodie, because um, you always have to have one of those, and this is Race of the Galaxy, and I already talked about it. So um, I do love it. It's definitely one of the older games in my collection. Um, so well worth checking out, as long as you prepare yourself for the symbols. What do we else we have? So best idea. Um, so yeah, the game that had the, the best idea, the best kind of notion behind it. And I'm going with Tyrants of the Underdark for this, and I haven't spoken about this one yet. So um, Tyrants of the Underdark is a D&D themed game, um, which is a deck building game, but also incorporates area control. So what this means is you have a deck of cards and in it you can have the power to buy further cards for your deck, but also a means to put tokens down on the board to claim zones so that you kind of have ownership of them to earn victory points. Um, I think this is an interesting combination. I think it's a, a good idea of putting these two types of games together. And while I'm not a huge fan of the board portion of Tyrants of the Underdark, I prefer the deck portion, I do think it's a really good idea. Um, so yeah, so that's Tyrants of the Underdark. Um, what's next? Best idea. Best introductory game. Um, I'm giving this to Las Vegas. I think it wins everything all the time. It's the game you can play with your granny, you can play with your friends, um, you can play with other gamers, and I think everyone will have a little fun with this dice rolling game. Um, when I describe it, it always sounds so boring, but for whatever reason, when you play it, it's really fun. Um, this is a game about winning money in a casino and you do this by rolling dice and matching the pips on the dice with the casino it is and the person who has the most pips in the casino will win the money and it's played over a couple of rounds um, there's some great moments there where you are kind of you can block each other off with your dice or you know you're kind of dueling each other's particular spots and I think that's what makes it fun and hilarious and also the die rolling means everyone's kind of equalized you know um, so I, I particularly love that um, so that's my best introductory game what's the last thing to play oh yeah well we had to fit something owl related in so who wants to play because that's kind of written on my logo and so this is the game that you would like to play with some other people and I'm going with the search for planet X um, no this this is I like to call it space Sudoku um, although it isn't really like that. Well, it kind of is. Um, so basically you are an astronomer and you're examining the night sky and you are looking for this planet X. And you basically get a piece of paper that shows you the sky and everything that could be in every quadrant. And it's up to you to get information to find out what's in each section and cross them off um, until you deduce um, where the planet is. Um, I really like this. Like I said, Space Sudoku is like, well, if this can't be there, well, it must be there. It's, it's one of those. Um, you do play it together, even though it feels quite solo to play. Um, and I think it would be fun to play with a group of people because the, the more people are there, there are more guesses that can happen, so you might acquire more information. Um, I like that it uses an app. Normally I wouldn't say such a thing, but in this case, I think it's actually kind of fun because you're not supposed to be telling each other what you know. Um, and it's nice to do something with pen and paper as well, that while interacting around a board with other players. So I think that would be really fun. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was the world's quickest rundown of the Golden <laughs> Board Game Awards. Um, I, there was also a question was asked about which has the game 
game has the cutest animal or the cutest meeple and I think the winner for that has to be Parks because it has such a great selection of meeples in there. I'm a big fan of the moose, he's got the whole thing going on. Um, yeah, so there's been a lot of good animal games this year though to pick from, to be fair. Um, but yeah, Parks is probably my favourite for meeples. Okay, finally, we get to the bit about um, the contest. Um, I don't normally do contests, so this is difficult, so please bear with me. Um, so. Here it is. This is open to worldwide, um, so you can enter from anywhere. And what you need to do to win a copy of Brian Baru is I need you to like and subscribe to the channel because hey, that's what we're here for. And in the comment below, um, just write Brian Baru or <laughs> just write Brian Brew, that's all you've got to do. And then I will reply and tell you what number you are in the contest and then this time next month, I will reveal the answer in the next monthly round of video. Does that seem fair? It seems, doesn't seem too cheesy or anything like that. Yeah, just, just write down the name of the game in the comments and I'll give you a number and then we'll randomly roll the number and pick a winner. Mm -hmm. Please don't live too far away. <laughs> um, so thank you to Osprey Games for um, accidentally sending me this extra copy for a giveaway. So um, this could be exciting. Um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully you'll enter and tell a friend and I'll try my best to spread the word. And tune in next month for another monthly roundup video where I'll probably have a lot to tell you guys because I didn't really tell you anything about the last month or so. So it'll be like a bumper edition. Isn't February always? I think so. But thanks for tuning in and I'll talk to you again soon. Happy New Year, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.